Welcome to day two of the Exploring for the Future program showcase 2022. My name is Marina Costello. I'm the head of the Mineral Systems Branch at Geosites Australia, and it's my pleasure to be your moderator today. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and elders, past and present. At Geoscience Australia, we acknowledge that our mission to be the trusted source of earth sciences information is preceded by tens of thousands of years of knowledge gained by generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of that wisdom and of the lands, waters and skies where we work, live and learn. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are Australia's original mappers, miners and navigators. This is the heart of our work. And we have so much to learn from their many thousands of years of related knowledge. Yesterday, Andrew Heap outlined the vision and provided an overview of the Exploring for the Future program with a focus on the outcomes and impacts of pre-competitive geoscience in Australia. That is the right-hand side of this impact pathway diagram. If you missed Andrew's talk, it is now available online. Today's session will focus on two themes on the left-hand side of this diagram, where most of our effort is spent. That is data acquisition, management and processing. That is how we use that data to understand Australia's geology. The work we will be showcasing is the result of extensive collaborations, and we would like to acknowledge these up front. The valuable partnerships span the Australian government departments and agencies, state and territory governments with whom we collaborate for all of our work, the Minex Cooperative Research Centre, and the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy Facilities, and lastly, universities across Australia and the world. Our first theme is focused on data and toolbox. Speakers are presenting on behalf of a large team including many scientists, administrators and other professionals. A large component of the Exploring for the Future program is focused on new data acquisition. So we start this session by providing an update on that. Our first speaker is Dr. Laura Gao, Program Manager for the Exploring for the Future program. Laura holds a Bachelor of Science Honours in Geology from the University of Melbourne and a PhD in Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems Modelling from the University of Queensland. Laura joined Geoscience Australia in 2007 and has experience in hydrogeology, groundwater dependent ecosystems, remote sensing, geology and geophysics, and more recently, project and program management. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Marina. The success of our data acquisition activities uh, contingent on working respectfully with communities and landholders to obtain land access consent we do this through best practice land access and engagement approaches based on the principles of ask first, free, prior and informed consent. By providing individuals and groups with accessible information, they're able to consider the risks and benefits of our proposed activities prior to making any decisions. To assist with this process, we've developed a range of communication products for non-technical audiences. This animation, which explains magnetotellurics, is one such example. My talk today will cover the breadth of our data acquisition activities. Other talks in the showcase will focus on what we're learning from these data sets. I've grouped the data sets by the focus of their investigations from the mantle to the surface. Mapping the mantle helps explain the geological evolution of the Australian continent and provides new insights into natural hazards and narrows the search space for mineral exploration. We use two passive geophysical methods, passive seismic and magnetotellurics, which measure natural vibrations and variations of the Earth's magnetic and electric fields. The data can then be turned into models that reveal the architecture and composition of rocks from the surface to the core. 
In the first phase of the program, we demonstrated the importance of the lithospheric architectural controls on mineralisation. We showed that globally, the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary at a depth of 170 kilometres fundamentally controls the distribution of sediment hosted deposits at the surface. But unlike Europe, America and parts of Asia, Australia's national seismometer coverage is sparse, which impacts on our ability to accurately measure the lithosphere. To address this issue, we in partnership with the Geological Surveys and Academia are installing an array of passive seismic sensors across the country at 200 kilometre spacing. These sensors will gather data simultaneously for more than a year, leading to improved three-dimensional models of Australia. Instruments are currently being deployed in the Northern Territory and we expect most of the array to be in place by Christmas. Our plan is to retrieve sensors in 2024 and publicly release the raw data once it's quality assured. The improved national model will help target future high resolution data collection like the 50 by 50 kilometre array data collected in Northern Territory in Queensland during the first phase of the program. We continue to generate and update 3D models using the data we've collected. On the right image is an example of an ambient noise tomography model which nicely images the newly discovered Carrara subbasin. The benefits of Osiray go beyond exploration as they support better characterisation of Australian earthquakes, which is improving our natural hazard assessments and making our communities safer. Magnetotellurics is another technique that provides multi-scale imaging and insights into mineral systems. The Australian Lithospheric Architecture Magnetic Project, Auslamp for short, provides first order reconnaissance surveys to resolve large scale lithospheric architecture and identify areas with mineral potential. Launched in 2013, Auslamp is a collaboration between government and academia to acquire long period data across the Australian continent at approximately 50 kilometre spacing. The resulting models are providing a new view of the Australian continent and stimulating mineral resource exploration in the process. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, we have significantly progressed Auslamp. We aim to release data and models approximately six months and 12 months after acquisition respectively. This model here and the accompanying data across Northern Australia was released in 2021. It revealed the mineralisation in the Tanami province is associated with conductors and that many conductors in the region remain underexplored. Since 2020, we've acquired data at more than 80 sites in Queensland and are currently working with the Geological Survey of Western Australia to obtain clearances for 80 to 100 sites in southwest Western Australia, with deployment planned later this year and early next year. Guided by the features revealed by the OzLamp dataset, we're also acquiring higher resolution infill broadband magnetotelluric surveys to provide greater detail in prospective areas. Enhanced resolution afforded by these surveys also help to characterise cover and assist with selected targets for stratigraphic drilling, which are the ultimate test of our geological models. We'll be acquiring new broadband magnetotellurics in South Australia and New South Wales, extending the grid of the Auslamp Kernamona Cube program eastward. These two data sets combined will provide better definition of anomalies under the Dalamerian origin and their significance for mineral potential and geological structure. Our pl planned timeframes for data acquisition and release are provided on the slide. The crust hosts many mineral deposits as well as groundwater and its composition affects the thermal maturation of organic materials in overlying basins. Therefore, the properties of the crust are important for assessing the energy, minerals and groundwater resource potential. The distribution and evolution of sedimentary basins are important because basins can host water, energy and mineral resources or act as the cover which obscures overlying basins and crystalline rocks. Given their importance, Geoscience Australia is working towards systematic characterisation of these units from top to bottom. We characterise the properties of the crust and basins using magnetics, gravity, seismic reflection, airborne electromagnetics and stratigraphic drilling, in addition to the passive seismic and magnetotelluric data I've already mentioned. One of the most fundamental data sets for mapping the crust is total magnetic intensity as it highlights lateral transition between buried rock types. 
Essentially, we're mapping the interaction between the Earth's magnetic field and the distribution of iron-rich minerals, most importantly magnetite. This is important for mineral exploration, but also useful in energy and groundwater studies to map buried paleo channels and estimate the depth of the basement. Australia has the best national magnetic data coverage in the world, and we continue to improve the resolution of this fundamental data set. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, in partnership with the Tasmanian government, we have acquired new airborne magnetics over Tasmania at 200 metre line spacing. Data from an earlier survey was released in 2021, and we expect to release data from the most recent survey this month. As illustrated with the inset map, the new data provides a significant improvement on the existing sparse and low quality magnetic data coverage dating back to 1960s to 1980s. The importance of magnetic coverage for mapping geology is arguably only surpassed by the constantly improving gravity coverage of Australia. Historically, this coverage has grown through progressive acquisition of ground-based stations shown by the black dots on the map on the left. However, the rise of airborne gravity data acquisition is transforming this coverage. As part of the program, we plan to acquire new airborne gravity over parts of South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria, as shown by the blue outline. Our aim is to enhance coverage over data poor areas and complement other imaging and analysis of the Dalamarian province, the ancient subduction zone along the east coast of Australia. Our survey will also complement recent surveys in Victoria and planned surveys over Adelaide, funded by Oscope, and the eastern half of Victoria, funded by the Victorian Government. Importantly, this data will improve the accuracy of the reference height surface essential for accurate positioning. Accurate positioning is critical for navigation and modelling of fluid flow, be that for major road construction projects, irrigation or flood mitigation. The survey is expected to commence towards the end of the year, with data expected to be released at the showcase next year. While magnetic and gravity data provide excellent lateral constraints on the distribution of rocks, seismic data provides the best method of imaging the subsurface vertically. We use reflection seismic images to map major crustal boundaries, subsurface structures and different stratigraphic units, all of which have implications for fluid movement, be that groundwater, oil and gas, or hydrothermal fluids responsible for mineral deposit formation. Deep crustal reflection seismic data acquisition in South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria, shown in the map, is due to be completed in late August. Raw data is expected to be released later this year and processed data in March to April next year. In the last two years, we've also released data and interpretations from the Barclay Seismic Survey and reprocessed legacy data in the Paterka, Officer and Bonaparte Bight Basins. Using airborne electromagnetics, we're able to detect variations in subsurface conductivity to a depth of several hundred metres. This information can tell us about the presence of salt, graphite, clays and sulphide minerals, thickness and characteristics of sedimentary and regolith cover, basin structures and groundwater resources. OzAM is the world's largest airborne electromagnetic survey undertaken. OzAM started in 2017 in Northern Australia and continues to be extended across the continent. It provides an important step towards a national geological framework and offers a regional context for more detailed, smaller scale AEM surveys. Over the last two years, the coverage of OzAM has grown significantly, particularly due to investment by the Geological Survey of Western Australia. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, we've acquired 20 kilometre line spacing data along the Eastern Corridor and are now focused on acquisition in the Western Corridor. Much of this data and models have already been released with several companies taking up tenement based on the new imaging of the subsurface this data provides. We also continue to infill national coverage with closer line spaced AEM surveys, specifically fluvial system architecture to aid groundwater studies along the Upper Darling River in New South Wales and the Musgrave province in Western Australia and the NT, and to aid mineral potential analysis in the Dalamarian in South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales as shown in the map by the red polygons. Acquisition in these areas is currently underway and the data will be processed, interpreted and released later this year. 
While the various data sets I've spoken about provide inferences about subsurface geology, drilling provides physical samples. Since 2020, through our collaboration with MinEx CRC, we have completed national drilling initiative campaigns in South Nicholson and East Tennant regions, as shown in the right-hand image. Drilling information of these wells has been released and is available via the respective project pages on the Exploring for the Future website. We continue to analyse this data and you'll hear more about that at one of the talks tomorrow. We are continuing with the National Drilling Initiative focusing on the Dalamarian origin in Western New South Wales. On our behalf, Minex CRC have submitted an exploration licence application, the location of which is shown in the left-hand map. If granted, we intend to relinquish these as soon as they're no longer required for drilling or soon after drilling results are published so as not to hinder any future exploration activity by industry. Our aim is to sample the stratigraphy of the Loch Lily Cars and Wentworth Mildura Puncari areas to understand their geological evolution and mineral potential. Drilling using the Minex CRC coil tube drilling rigs and limited conventional diamond drilling in key areas is anticipated to commence early in the 2023 calendar year and will be completed later that year. Finally, undiscovered features at or near the Earth's surface can provide valuable clues as to what lies beneath. Properties of the surface also place first order controls on surface and groundwater interactions. The main data sets include surface geochemistry, radiometrics, groundwater sampling and magnetic resonance. Radiometric data measures the concentration of potassium, uranium and thorium in the near surface. Changes in lithology or soil type are often accompanied by changes in these concentrations, so radiometric data is helpful for detecting associated mineral deposits. It can also delineate surface draining features, near surface groundwater aquifers and different soil types helpful from an agricultural and land management perspective. Tasmania has one of the poorest radiometric coverages in Australia. So while acquiring the magnetic data over Tasmania, we also acquired new airborne radiometrics, filling in gaps in the national coverage. Data from an earlier survey was released in 2021, and we expect to release the most recent survey, shown in, the, in blue on the left-hand map, later this month. Using the National Geochemical Survey of Australia collection of overbank sediments, We've partnered with Curtin University to analyse the heavy mineral concentrations. Over 140 minerals have been identified and quantified, with over 29 million individual minerals ID'd. The first tranche of heavy mineral data, including 223 bottom sediment samples from the darling Kernamona Dalamarian region, is now available. Eventually, this data set will cover approximately 80% of Australia, delivering the world's first continental scale, publicly available heavy mineral data set and accompanying maps. This vast amount of data requires novel analysis and visualisation methods, which have been achieved using a bespoke cloud-based mineral network analysis tool. Users can visualise and explore the data, discover heavy mineral associations and download mineral counts. The partial data release is the first publicly accessible tranche of heavy mineral map of Australia data. We welcome any feedback that will make future partial and complete releases more useful to stakeholders, be that industry, government or academia. Insights from this data will be discussed in a later talk by Ariane Ford. Australia is the driest inhabited continent, making water use and management a key challenge. Reliable water resources are critical for successful and healthy Australian communities, especially in remote areas. As outlined in the recently released State of the Environment report, pressure on our water resources, both surface and groundwater, is only expected to increase with climate change, making it more important than ever to manage this vital resource. As part of the Exploring for the Future program, we're improving our understanding of groundwater resources, supporting improved resource management and future water security across the country. We're undertaking two detailed groundwater investigations in the Upper Darling floodplain in New South Wales and the Musgrave province in Central Australia. As I mentioned in a previous slide, we're acquiring AEM over these areas, which will be complemented by the collection of magnetic resonance data 
groundwater sampling and analysis over the next 12 months. Magnetic resonance is proving particularly powerful in extrapolating water table depths and hydraulic conductivity away from boreholes. During the first phase of the program, we also undertook groundwater investigations in multiple locations as shown in the national map and have continued to release data and publications from this work over the last two years. New knowledge and insights from these studies are already informing water resource management. While there are too many publications to list here, all can be found via Geoscience Australia's product catalogue, ECAT, by searching on the project names listed. So in conclusion, I hope that through this tour of the subsurface, you've got a new appreciation of our data acquisition activities and the range of new data and models we'll be releasing over the coming 12 months. While the Exploring for the Future program is Geoscience Australia's largest investment in pre-competitive geoscience data acquisition, it is by no means the only one. For other data acquisition activities, both onshore and offshore, I encourage you to check out the Geoscience Australia website. A key objective for the program is getting data and information in the hands of those that need it. With that in mind, we continue to release outputs publicly through the Geoscience Australia product catalogue and the Exploring for the Future data discovery portal. You can learn more about the program at the Exploring for the Future program website, which has just been completely redeveloped to improve the user experience. You can also stay in touch by following Geoscience Australia on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook and subscribing to the program's monthly newsletter. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, for that update. In subsequent sessions, we will build and elaborate on the data sets presented here. Next, we turn our attention to some of the quantitative tools that we develop at Geoscience Australia, which make the large scale data collection that you have heard about possible. Dr. Ananda Rupray, one of our senior geophysicists, will provide an update focused on the development of high QGA and hypersize code bases, which underpins Australia's airborne electromagnetic OZ AEM and passive seismic OZ array activities. Dr. Ananda Rupray is a geophysicist interested in applying mathematics for resource management, exploration, and conservation. He has worked internationally across industry, academia and government since 2007. Hello, today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the quantitative tools we've developed as part of exploring for the future in this phase. Uh, we've developed lots of quantitative tools, but I will be talking particularly about two of them, uh, high quality geophysical analysis and high performance seismology. So without further ado, um, the first thing you'd like to know about these software tools we're developing is, well, how do you find them? And we are available on Google. If you search for HiQGA, then hopefully the first thing you see should be the link to our uh, GitHub repository. Uh, there's also a bit of a historical overview that's given by uh, this video we presented in April of this year. And right over here, we've got a, a bunch of blurbs or uh, themes which elaborate what it is that high quality geophysical analysis is all about and what it can do. So you can see over here that there's a bunch of physics, there's a bunch of statistics, there's a bunch of inference, optimization. Um, I'm sure you're going to love it. <laughs> so um, when we talk about the HiQGA framework, first of all, the most important thing to note is that it's all open source. So which means it's freely available. You can go, you can download it. It's written in Julia, which is a numerically focused language, which is also open source, has an excellent and diverse user community. The kinds of physics we can handle are of various types. So there's airborne electromagnetics, uh, which can see into the Earth, uh, say, a couple of hundred meters. Um, the surface magnetic resonance, which can gauge water content in the Earth to a few tens of meters to about 100 meters or so. And then there's also magnetotellurics, or the empty method as it's called, which can look all the way down to hundreds of kilometers, depending on the frequency. Or you might not be interested in geophysics at all, uh, you might be interested in um, just doing something like regression or filling in blank values in between places where you have data. So this is a heat map over here of places where you have data and you want to fill in stuff in between. And look, this is the kind of inference that we can give you. And that's actually a milk drop taken from a set of test images available for image processing. So it shouldn't matter what it is you're trying to do. You should be able to do all of it from one source. And that's the unified framework that HiQGA gives you. So it's multi-physics 
and also um, we're able to tell you about the uncertainties associated with uh, the physics in question. So any fuzziness you see in any of these plots, well, it doesn't matter what the, what the physics is. Uh, the fuzziness is associated with the uncertainty that uh, the data recorded on the surface are, um, are telling you about. So there's more than 200,000 lines of code that we've written over the last uh, two and a half years or so, and you can see how that's uh, ticked up since uh, the second phase of uh, EFDF started off. And it's not enough to have code there, because as users of open source software know that it's often very frustrating to deal with documentation. So we've made an attempt to um, put some documentation in there as well with lots of examples. So you can uh, run these examples in, in notebook style. Um, and again, there's issues that you can open on GitHub. So if you'd like the code modified or if you'd like to make changes to the code uh, or the documentation, just let us know, raise an issue, and, and we will assign someone to do it. So where does all this code fit into what GA does? So here's the uh, Great Artesian Basin outlined in yellow. Um, so it covers quite a bit of Australia. And um, using an airborne electromagnetic surveying technique, which is helicopter borne over here, uh, we've tried to image the intake beds for where water gets into the uh, Great Artesian Basin. And that is actually the, uh, the helicopter that um, carried out the survey. And that's the setup. Uh, that's the uh, transmitter uh, loop which is being carried by the helicopter about 40 meters underneath. And the entire assembly uh, you know, flies at about 40 meters ground clearance. So it's, it's a really uh, nifty piece of engineering which allows us to image the Earth. The images of the Earth that we're able to get um, look like that. Uh, blues tend to be more resistive and um, reds tend to be more conducting. And I'm not a geologist, so don't jump at me. But uh, to first order, uh, if you've got clays, they tend to be more conducting, and, and they tend to block where water can um, pass through. So if you've got little bits of red over there, they're probably aquitards. And if you've got little bits of blue over here, they're probably sandy and more resistive. And, and that probably forms a pathway for water to fall through. So with, with this sand clay interbedding and layering, uh, that's how we're able to map over 160 kilometers over here where water flows through the Earth. And all of this stuff is in the subsurface because if you'll note that um, the, the depth scale over there um, shows you about 100 to 200 meters into the subsurface. And none of this stuff is visible on the surface itself. So um, this is how we're able to add value by going at a relatively fast rate, 80 kilometers per hour, with a surveying uh, machine that's uh, helicopter borne, and, and survey large swathes of land uh, relatively quickly. Um, we can also provide to you the uncertainty associated with those images, because unlike medical imaging, um, what we have is a device that's flying 40 meters above the ground. Uh, we can't surround the, the Earth with sensors like in medical imaging, we are surrounded by imaging sensors. So um, naturally, we have a lot less informative data, which means we also have more uncertainty associated with what we're able to image. Actually, the only thing we record is voltage in that loop that you saw that the uh, helicopter carries. We have to do complicated image processing, uh, a bit of mathematics known as inverse uh, optimization, and that lets us construct images of the subsurface. But associated with the optimization of the inversion process are uncertainties. And we can show you these uncertainties over here, where we're showing you uh, what you probably might relate to in your exams as percentiles. You know, you might have been told you're a 10th percentile student, or a 50th percentile student, or a 90th percentile student. I've always been on the lower percentiles. But um, notwithstanding, if you see the same colors in all percentiles, uh, that means that um, we're more certain because um, things are more probable because the percentiles are bunched together. Whereas if you see different colors across different percentiles, it means that the percentiles are spread out and so we're less certain about what's going on in the Earth. So say for example over here, um, it seems that in all percentiles, you know, it is possible uh, that there is something that stops uh, the flow of water. Whereas if we looked at the previous image, we don't see that on a deterministic image. So we can give you the uncertainties associated with which um, uh, the Earth can be imaged, which lets you make decisions under uncertainty for things like uh, the flow of water and its management. We're able to do all of this stuff because we have a calibration range 
And this calibration range is the proving ground for all the technologies which we use to image the subsurface all over Australia. So um, we're looking here at Southeast Australia. We're looking at New South Wales. In particular, we're looking at the region around Broken Hill. We're looking at Minindee Lakes. And uh, we've got a test range there, which is um, a bunch of airborne electromagnetic lines, which we make sure that all our vendors who carry the uh, transmitter and receiver technology, and it's, it's their technology we use to image the Earth, but most of the processing we do. So we are able to hold them uh, to ground truth that we have, because in this part of the earth where you've got sometimes a, a, a very salty lake to very dry ground, there's a clear transition in, in geology over there. And, and we know what the subsurface looks like over there because we've drilled the earth. So whether it be a fixed wing aircraft or whether it be a helicopter borne system that is carrying the uh, airborne electromagnetic equipment, we know what the earth looks like and we can process the data that's provided to come up with images of the Earth, just like I showed you before for the Great Artesian Basin. Now, if I asked you to differentiate between the left column and the right column, I would bet that it would be very hard for you to tell um, which one is of better quality, because essentially, to first order, they're saying the same thing, and the left order corresponds to one of these systems, and the, left and the right column corresponds to the other of, of these systems. But, but <laughs> Even I can't tell a part at this point which is which, and the uncertainties associated with the image of the subsurface are, are about the same. So which means that you know, this, this technology is, is good for imaging the Earth because um, both are showing similar kinds of uncertainty. They're, they're both, they're both um, uh, showing similar things. And if I'd like to point out over here that there's the shape of the lake, which we can see, and that's in both sets of images. Um, and it's pretty certain that there is a lake over there. And uh, as you get deeper, well, we're, we're less certain. And that's natural when it comes to trying to image the Earth, because the deeper you go, the less you're able to see. And we have ground truth in the area. And I'm not going to dwell on these images. But essentially, brighter colors mean higher probability. Darker colors mean lower probability. And you've got these skirts over here, which tell you how bunched up the probabilities are. Wherever the skirts are more bunched up, you're more probable, and the skirts should follow what we have actually logged in the earth while drilling, and what we've logged in the earth while drilling is this yellow line over there where someone's actually gone out with an instrument and recorded the conductivity of the earth. So our probabilities are showing you that we are very well aligned and very compatible with what's been drilled in the earth. So what this means is that both technologies pass assessment very well, our imaging technologies work, and these proving grounds are very important because once we've tested at a calibration range, here we are. We can do a, a 25,000 line kilometer survey, which is a little further north here than the uh, proving ground. This is the upper Darling floodplains. So that diagonal along this image is about 500 kilometers. And we're looking at about 16 meters underneath the surface. So this is something you would not be able to get from a satellite, because satellites can only tell you what's on the surface. And again, keeping with our theme, reds are more conductive, um, blues are more resistive. But in this case, the reds could be conducting because you might have um, salty water or saline water, or you might have clays. And, and this is something that our uh, hydrogeologists and geologists will talk more about. Uh, in particular, Dr. Sarah Buckerfield will, will have much more to say about this project, and, and you, you can uh, listen to her talk in one of the other videos. And all of this has been done because we've been able to write those 200,000 lines of code, and because we've been able to test it and the contractor technology over the proving grounds that I just mentioned. And of course, this is useful not only to us, but it's also useful to some of our state and territory partners, such as uh, in New South Wales, Department of Planning and Environment. Now, the software we write, is open source, but it also has to play nice with other kinds of software. So whether you're using Google Earth to get satellite images that we've just gotten over there, or whether you're using Paraview to view things in 3D, we're able to put all of the stuff together to come up with meaningful images of the subsurface with the geomorphologists, or whether you're a farmer, or whether you're a watershed manager, uh, or just whether you're a property owner. You can put all of these things together without having to buy expensive software, because we try and make things as freely, freely available as possible. Um, 
The other theme that I mentioned right at the beginning is the fact that all our code is modular. So it shouldn't matter what kinds of uh, physics you're using. So with the magnetic resonance technique, which you might be familiar with in, in medical imaging, again, keeping to the medical analogy, um, we can't take an MRI machine out onto the Earth. We take a loop of wire. But using that loop of wire and, and doing the physics associated with spinning hydrogen nuclei, we're able to image excitations in the Earth wherever there are spinning hydrogen nuclei uh, by first exciting the Earth with an inducing um, AC current. And using that, we're able to image changes in the hydrologic profile uh, within water, especially the amount of water and the water content. And, and that's borne out really well by this measured uh, well log over there. And this is the inference from the surface. And again, the two are very compatible, which tells you that um, you know, our, our software is, is working as it has been intended to. Uh, last but not least, uh, we've got the uh, high performance seismology uh, or the hypersize package, which is also available on GitHub, though this is not part of Heike GA. Um, this uses a lot of parallelization, which we have implemented on the uh, NCI, or the National Computer Infrastructure at the ANU. Um, so it's able to handle thousands, if not tens of thousands of station pairs of seismological data in parallel. So the kinds of processing which just a few years ago used to take hours or days or even months, we can do in minutes because of the kinds of parallel processing that we're now able to do. We've also gotten the uh, ability to ingest all kinds of data, regardless of its provenance. It could be coming from the Australian National University. It could be coming from the worldwide IRIS networks. It could be coming from Indonesia. It could be GA's own Oz array, which you know, for a while was around the uh, Tennant Creek and Mount Isa region. And we're still able to process it to make beautiful images of uh, velocity distributions in the Earth, as you see over there. And we can also use open source tools, and we can use um, tools such as GoCAD to be able to make slices in 3D, um, such that we're able to investigate the Earth up to hundreds of kilometers in, in depth. So the reason we're able to image the uh, subsurface as effectively as we are able to do is that we are not divorced from reality. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time out in the field ensuring that uh, the technologies that we are processing in the office are actually delivering what they are supposed to process. Um, that some of our colleagues are contemplating 12,000 volts out in the field with our uh, colleagues from uh, CSIRO, our aviation safety expert, ensuring that the helicopters that fly our, our loop systems are actually, they pass the relevant safety uh, benchmarks. We do this such that we get the best quality data. We do this because we ensure the well-being of our uh, vendors. And we ensure that the data that's delivered is up to spec and is of use to the Australian taxpayer while ensuring that all our stakeholders are, are yeah, uh, safe and that their well-being is, is ensured. Uh, none of this would be possible without uh, the, the people that make it happen. Uh, starting from the top right over there, we've got Richard Taylor, Neil Symington, Rakib Hassan, that's myself over there to, to his left. We've got Negin Mogadzam, uh, we've got Yusen uh, Lay Cooper, and in the center we've got Ross C. Brody. If you want to find us, again, I will stress that just look for HiQGA or HyperSize. You'll find us on our um, GitHub websites. And last but not least, we have a short course that we're delivering in Perth on the 11th of August, uh, jointly organized between the AIG and GA. Uh, but if you aren't able to make it, uh, don't worry, uh, the slides will be available online. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. The progress being made in rapid quantitative imaging is truly amazing. For the data sets we acquire to be useful now and into the future, they need to be carefully stored, managed and delivered. Our last speaker in this session is Mark Webster, who will provide an update on data delivery advances and data curation. Mark is the Director for Information Services and the Divisional Information Officer. His role is to ensure all aspects of information technology and information management are considered now and into the future when delivering the science needs of this program. Mark has been at Geoscience Australia for over 20 years and has worked in many roles, always providing an outstanding level of service. His expertise is in business architecture, spatial data management, staff leadership and communication. Welcome. 
I'm going to present the data delivery advances, which is a key component within exploring for the future program. Obviously, this is not an individual effort and relies on a diverse set of multidisciplinary teams to deliver impactful results. This includes both scientific and highly technical staff contributions. This presentation will focus on some of the underpinning data that has been acquired, but with a key focus on the delivery aspect. This won't be a scientific presentation, but rather a highlight of key technical capabilities the EFTF program has successfully completed to date. Key capabilities which will support our future outcomes. So let's start with some brief stats on what we have achieved to date with regard to data and delivery. The EFTF program has loaded millions of new data samples. These have been quality assured, analysed and loaded into our corporate databases. Due to new types of data being collected, we've had to build new corporate databases as well as redevelop existing ones. We have compiled a large proportion of data from legacy data holdings, reports and publications and have built hundreds of thousands of Python code that has been developed to build new workflows, machine learning and data modelling capabilities. Dozens of new web services have been developed and delivered through the portal. And as we progress through this presentation, you will see that a lot of the new capabilities developed are seen through the EFTF portal. Here are some key examples of a few key data sets the program has delivered. Data sets that are available for external stakeholders to access through the EFTF portal to do their own analysis work. Each data set is provided with their own scientific capabilities, as well as standard features found within the EFTF program. This includes rock properties, geochronology, hydrogeochemistry, geophysical grids, stratigraphic units, and isotopes. A key deliverable of the EFTF program is the EFTF portal. In fact, the majority of images and movies throughout this presentation are from the online tool. So what is the EFTF portal? It is a key capability to promote the outcomes of, from the program, as well as an interactive online capability with new tools, multiple criteria assessment facilities, as well as data visualisation and delivery features. The goal is to provide our stakeholders the ability to access GA data easily, to interact with the data from a science workflow perspective and to make decisions in a timely fashion. As an introduction to the EFTF portal, I would like to highlight some basic features within the EFTF toolkit. These are features a user would like to use when interacting within the EFTF portal. This describes the EFTF program and links to our associated partners. This is where the users can access the data as layers and display them on a map. You can base your search on a particular area if needed, and a big part of the EFTF program are the products, including publications and reports. This function helps you discover them while interacting with the data. Users can share their online session as a link with other users, as well as the autosave option means users can opt to have their session within the portal automatically saved so when they close down the portal and come back you revert back to the display they had previously. The EFTF portal is one of many personas that are available. Users can change from one persona to another. A persona is a customised skin for a particular topic or project, but still with the same capabilities. The dynamic scale bar is always updating based on the zoom scale users use, and the EFTF program is always seeking user input, so please email us on your constructive feedback. This highlights the coordinates of where the mouse is always being tracked within the map display, and users can also ask for help using the AI chatbot. It is still learning, so please bear with it. Data can be displayed in a 3D context. You will hear more about that later. As well as users can split the screen and load different data sets for comparison. And in case you get lost, rest view can always help. All these functions and capability are very similar to desktop GIS applications and are designed to help the user when interacting with the EFTF data layers. I will now show you a small movie to highlight how users can interact with the data within the portal. Users can display data through the Layers Hub, but also by selecting a list of groups of data layers based on a topic. Here we have selected Geochronology. We will now select another layer, noting you can view other layers before you load them in. We have selected Isotope. You can get some metadata about it. You can change the legend if you need to, as well as changing the different layers based on different attributes. You, we also have the capability for various filtering based on the data that has been loaded. 
At any stage, a user can also select an item from the map display. Here is a single point, and this shows the values. If a user wants more details, they can deep dive further into the GA databases to seek more information about that data or data set. Again, providing users with a key capability to improve the user experience with interacting with the EFTF data online. The EFTF portal has a lot of unique capabilities that are all available to external stakeholders. I'll highlight a few functions including the use of pool, tools and persona. Here you can see the amount of specialised tools a user can utilise within the EFTF portal. The use of personas, however, can be used to jump from one customised persona or skin to another, all the while providing specific customised tools and data specific for that topic. So here you can see specialised tools as well as layers for this particular capability and we can jump to another persona which will have a different type of view which will highlight its different, its different tools as well as data layers. A persona can be used for any topic including project or even a scientific discipline. So for example here, energy is being selected. The EFTF portal, which we'll revert back to, is simply another persona within the whole portal toolbox kit. With clip, zip and ship capabilities, it is simply as described. Users can select an area and search for all the data associated with that area. They can display the data and select which data they require. And by selecting a few extra parameters and details, the users can simply be sent the data they have requested via email. So here we're going to select a vector of points and some grids, and now the user will actually select the, the way they want the data the type of data they want selected, the projection they would actually like it presented as, and if need be, type of resampling they would like, and then sent it via email. Users like to remember what they did the last time they interacted with the system. Here we highlight the ability users can display some data and save a session and bring it back at any time. So here we have selected some data. We are now going to bookmark it, give it a name, and save that bookmark. This is useful if you need to close the portal and try to remember what you did the day before. So we're now going to remove some data and then we're going to bring back what we had originally saved as a bookmark. You can have multiple bookmarks at any one time with different data associated with it. You can also use the auto save button which saves your session every few seconds in case you'll close your session unexpectedly and not lose anything that you have created. All the data or layers within the EFTF portal are web services. Every image or movie of the EFTF portal you see in all these presentations you're going to see are of the data as a web service. This is to help standardise the data for visualisation and delivery. It decouples the data from the delivery aspect. It is also to help users better interact with the data outside of an online system. So here we have a geochronology web services within the EFTF portal. It is a key data product which is available to anyone internally and externally. It is also a default layer in the Tasmanian government on their MRT map viewer. But more importantly, this is a web service that can be used by external sources from an ArcGIS desktop application or in an open source application like QGIS, making it interoperable between all these disparate technology systems. A key aspect of the EFTF portal is for users to load their own data and interact with it as well as the layers already available. Here you can select data like a shapefile as well as loading a web service from an external source that you might get from anywhere from around the world and display it as per normal like you were playing with any GA data you might find within the portal. A key component of the EFTF portal is the increasing demand for 3D visualisation. Here we are displaying onshore seismic lines across Australia as ribbons and displayed in 3D form. While this movie shows, it also shows a capability for viewing AEM data at a national scale. We have a lot of data that is ready and available within the EFTF portal, including the interpretation for various surveys. You can see how much detail we have provided for each seismic survey. The portal provides the ability to move around in 3D while in a browser with any downloadable plugins. It is quite significant and will certainly grow and increase into the future. 
It certainly helps lower the entry bar for stakeholders and when accessing our 3D data and visualisation capabilities. It is also a key aspect of future development within the EFTF portal. Another set of key capabilities is the ability to create a profile from a data point or a raster grid. Here I have a basic raster grid and the ability to create a simple profile of the data across the selected line. This is a capability which is used for, many dust, for any raster surfaces. We also have another grid, this time with key data points. Points which a user can select into a profile form straight from the database. A profile line can then be created by the map, by the user within the map to display multiple horizons. Each aspect of the profile can be followed along the original line if needed. This obviously will help users to better understand the gridded data across any user-defined profile. On this slide, we will highlight some major external capabilities that we hear more about in upcoming presentations. The Economic Fairways Mapper Tool, a multi-criteria decision support tool to identify regions that are economically viable. The tool generates a heat map and a report for a user-defined region. The commodity of interest, the economic variables, and many other considerations can be selected by the user with a heat map produced for the user to assess. We have also included this for different mineral assessments as well as a hydrogen perspective. Here you will see we see a change in the criteria based on the different data for the hydrogen assessment. We will select different variables and then run a different assessment based on the hydrogen and you'll be able to have multiple outcomes and then compare them if required. Estimates of geological and geophysical services. This is an interactive data analytical tool for querying, downloading and plotting estimates of geological and geophysical services, also known as EGGS data. Here we will interact with multiple variables and display the data in a graph which can also be interactive. And here we have the Geophysical Archive Data Delivery System, also known as GADS. This system provides magnetic, radiometric, gravity and digital elevation data from Australian national, state and territory government geophysical data archives. This persona provides a user with the capability to select an area of interest, search and select what geophysical data is available within that area and the user can then select what they require based on that selection that they have. The parameters are then put through the system and again an email is then provided based on what the user selects. It should also be noted that a lot of the EFTF capabilities are also being used in a varied number of different personas for other projects and international stakeholders from around GA. This includes the Critical Minerals Mapper in conjunction with the Geological Survey of Canada and the United States Geological Survey, focusing on building a diversified critical minerals industry in Australia. The Hydrogen Economic Fairways Tool, also known as HEFT. Here is a persona of the Minex CRC National Drilling Initiative and a marine area uses this capability for their seabed and bathymetry data capability. These are just some of the personas available for stakeholders. So what is next within the EFTF portal besides the ongoing increase of data delivery? We also have the, the need that GA is changing its branding. You may not notice it, but there are some highlights here that it, of noticing of some of these changes. Users will soon have the ability to create cartographic maps on the fly from the EFTF portal. We will continue to engage stakeholders with feedback and make the technology work for everyone. We will continue to train the chatbot AI so the user's experience for support is continually being improved. Continue to assess and improve different online and cloud capabilities to improve the user experiences, no matter the device used, for example, through smartphones. We will continue to enhance existing science analysis tools, incorporating changes based on user feedback. And we will also create new collaborative tools within the portal tools to improve the user's interaction with GA and other external data holdings. And lastly, we will utilise the code and capabilities developed by the Loop 3D initiative. Our aim is to grow and extend the capabilities for improved data interaction and user experience. 
Thank you for listening. If you need any further details on the EFTF program and the portal, please follow this link. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to all the speakers in this session. We'll now move into an open question and answer session until 1.40 with the speakers and Geoscience Australia's subject matter experts that are online.